Welcome back to this lecture on digital communication using GNU radio. My name is Kumar Appaya and I belong to the Department of Electrical Engineering at IIT Bombay. In this lecture, we are going to continue our discussion on demodulation and signal space. If you remember, in the last lecture, we saw a detailed calculation of the basis vectors for a set of signals using Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization and I also made some remarks about how you can sometimes just by inspection infer some of the orthogonal basis vectors. Once we have a handle on the orthogonal basis vectors for the signals, the key idea that we are going to see is that the projection of the noise onto these orthogonal basis vectors is a sufficient statistic which in other words means that only getting the numbers by integrating with these size, the integrating the noise with the size that is enough to determine optimally which symbol was sent or make the optimal choice. So, let us look at projecting the signal and noise onto the signal space. So, we have y of t is s i of t times n of t okay, with basis signals psi 1, psi 2 up to psi n. If we now consider uh, y as inner product y comma psi 1, y comma psi 2 up to y comma psi n transpose, what this gives you is this gives you a vector with which, which basically gives a set of numbers obtained by projecting y of t onto psi 1, projecting y of t onto psi 2 and so on. In this case, I have not had the, I did not add the subscript si, but you can just assume these ss to be si's. So, you obtain another set of n numbers by projecting s of t onto psi 1, s of t onto psi 2 and so on. This is fine because your s of t or si of t was designed to be lying within the space of the signal psi 1 to psi n and this is what we saw in the previous class that you constructed your basis orthonormal basis vectors psi 1 through psi n to capture all the si's. But the trouble is over here, here the problem is that n of t is something which is a completely different beast, it is a signal obtained you know because of noise it is not predictable and you can most definitely say that you cannot write n of t as a linear combination of psi 1, psi 2, psi 3. That is n of t definitely has some components and variations that cannot be captured by just expressing it as the linear combination of psi 1 and psi 2 and psi n. This leads to the question which is by projecting n onto psi 1, psi 2 and psi n which is what you are doing indirectly by projecting y onto psi 1, psi 2, psi n, am I losing some information? Is it that some information is lost when doing this particular operation that results in you are not being able to make the optimal decision on which si was sent? So, the key idea is that we are trying to convert it to a vector problem as we mentioned it is now instead of a waveform problem, we have converted it to a vector problem. What can we say about this n and its contribution to the vector decision problem? So, for the first thing we are going to look at is what is the distribution of n? Now, if you remember we just did this particular exercise in a couple of lectures ago. If you now study the correlation between n psi 1 and n psi 2, it is actually going to be sigma square times inner product of psi 1 and psi 2. So, inner product psi k psi l which is 0 if k not equal to l and if k is equal to l inner product psi k psi k is 1. So, this n is a Gaussian random vector consisting of iid entries the variance of each component is n naught by 2. So, in other words you are going to get this vector n 1, n 2 and so on up to n n's pardon for pardon me for the bad notation because this n was for numbers this n was for noise but all of these entries are iid in other words the covariance matrix is sigma square times i so these are iid entries so the first thing that we are going to notice whenever you make a decision on which one was sent and so on you know these psi 1 psi 2 psi n's capture that part of n of t into n1 n2 and you know and so on and these n's are orthogonal because your size are orthogonal. That is the first thing and this orthogonality translates to independence. So, in other words the entries of n are 
IID. The next question that we are going to ask is, is the restriction to the signal space optimal? That is what I was mentioning. By restricting N of t to just look at those parts of N of t that are along psi 1 and psi 2 and psi n, are we losing something? Are we losing our ability to make an optimal decision on which SI was sent? The key concept is that we will say no. The idea is that no, we are not losing any information. The part that uh, part of N of t that is along, not along psi 1, psi 2 and psi n is actually irrelevant. It is not at all, it has no bearing on your optimal decision to decide which SI was sent. The concept can be uh, also, you know, this concept is also known as the theorem of irrelevance and, you know, irrelevant statistics and so on. And it is not very difficult to see. How? What you are doing is you are essentially you have y of t, you do not have n of t separately, you have only y of t. You take y of t and project it onto psi 1, psi 2, psi n and then find out the residual signal. That is you have y of t, you project it onto psi 1, you project it onto psi 2, then construct the signal y1 times psi 1 times psi 1 of t, inner product y1 psi 1 times psi 1 of t, inner product y1 sorry, inner product y psi 2 and so on and then take it away from y of t and see what have, what is there. So, for example, over here, if you do that, your y of t, y, y perpendicular of t is equal to y of t minus summation uh, j is equal to 1 to n inner product y comma okay, uh, psi j times psi j of t. That is, I am taking away that part of y that is along the psi j's to get the residual part. And you know that your y is actually si plus n. So, if you substitute it, you get y of t is summation j equal to 1 to n inner product si times psi j times psi j plus inner, ah, this should be, my, yeah, this should be minus I think, yes. No, so this should be this should be minus yes, minus summation j equal to one to n inner product n psi j times psi j. So because your y is s plus n, this part is the component of y that is uh, contributed by ss. This part is that contributed by ns. This part is fully captured, while this part is not fully captured. How does this reflect? Because if you now write y of t as s of t plus n of t, s of t and this particular part will cancel directly because s of t is fully captured, this part is actually s of t. So, if you now look at y of t minus s of t, you get n of t minus inner product n comma psi j times psi j of t and let us call this n perpendicular of t. That is that part of the noise that is not along the part that you observe which is along psi 1, psi 2 and psi n. So, <coughs> We are saying this n perpendicular, which is the part that is lost because of your projections, is irrelevant. How? The irrelevance of n perpendicular of t can be ascertained by looking at the covariance of n perpendicular and each of these n and psi case. That is because these are the parts that are going to determine which si was sent. So, let us look at that. Okay, sorry. So, let us look at that. So, if you now just evaluate the covariance of n perpendicular and the part that is along the psi k, you will find that that is 0. In other words, you can just use the fact that the n perpendicular is uncorrelated with each of the components all of uh, the vector n which you get by pro pro projecting n along psi 1, psi 2, psi k and this uncorrelatedness translates to independence and this means that the n perpendicular is irrelevant. So, this detailed proof is something we are not looking at over here, but you can look at the references and get them. But the key idea is that because the part that is not along psi 1, psi 2 is independent of the parts that actually matter when you compute your matrix to decide what is sent, this part is irrelevant. <coughs> so, one remark that we, have, we want to make is that whenever we perform 
this inner product s comma psi i it fits real signal it's just integral if it's imagine you know if it's complex then you have a star it doesn't matter this is called a correlation operation a correlation operation is basically where you multiply two signals and evaluate the integral maybe with a shift also in this case we are just not having adding a shift that's completely fine but <clears throat> because we are dealing with communication systems which are also signal processing systems in you know in internally many operations or signal processing operations it is convenient to express these in the form of a convolution that is because for example even from an implementation perspective uh, if you implement some algorithms on a dsp convolution is often implemented uh, in a very efficient way so these dsps are designed to perform convolution in hardware and they are very fast and things like that so given this it's often the case that the match filtering is implemented using a convolution so to do this what you need to do is you have want to find actually this is uh, this should not be rift it should be ri oh yeah rift sorry let me just get rid of this so ri of tau that is yes so let's find this ri of tau which is a signal obtained by performing ah uh, integral y of tau psi star of tau minus t d tau why is it psi star of tau minus t the reason is because you are essentially to perform correlation you are flipping the signal if you flip and convolve that same as correlation right because you know if you just do this kind of yeah let's let me actually just rewrite it in a proper way okay you are essentially performing y of this is y of tau multiplied by psi i star of t plus tau dt this actually will be y convolution psi star of minus so is it like may, maybe i'll just express it in a, in a correct way so it should be plus this is equal to y of t convolution psi star of minus t that's what is happening so correlation can be obtained by performing flipped convolution and if you want to just evaluate this quantity you need to just substitute your t as 0 because if you substitute your t as 0 you essentially get ri of 0 so what you typically do is you perform the convolution with the flip version of psi and sample at the zeroth point so what you typically have is you have a bank of what are called matched filters so what are these matched filters essentially you write psi 0 or psi 0 conjugate depending on whether it's real or complex psi 0 psi 1 psi 2 and you keep writing them up to psi m uh, m minus actually it should be psi n minus 1 t sometimes i use psi 1 to psi n in this case i use psi 0 to psi n minus 1 so in this case you are going to get now several numbers r0 r1 up to r2 which are essentially the inner products with each of the basis elements so this essentially is going to give you a set of numbers which you can collate into a vector r0 through rn minus 1 and this vector is all that you are going to need to make an optimal decision why because even though the part of y of t which is noise is not fully captured along psi 0 to psi n minus 1s it is irrelevant to your decision making there is one alternate interpretation of all this match filtering and you know irrelevance these so called match filters collect all the necessary statistics to get the sufficient statistic from the noisy signal and throw away what is not needed let me give you a quick intuition as to why that is the case let's suppose that the signal you send is like something like this then what happens is that because of noise you end up getting something like this and intuitively the optimal thing to do is to average these things average these out right because if you just average these out then you can make a good decision on whether you are sending this or you are sending zero or something like that right what does the match filter do the match filter is actually this you are multiplying and integrating which is the same as averaging so the match filter actually is designed in a way to collect all the necessary information from the noisy signal to make sure that you get the sufficient statistic so that is the key intuition that you have to take away from this so this is the concept of match filters it's provided with different perspectives like you know optimal in terms of decision making and so on but 
if you want to look at it from the correlation perspective to recover your original symbol, that is also the same result. <coughs> now, let us briefly look at optimal reception in the context of, context of AWGN channels. We are now performing MRE signaling in an AWGN channel. So, you have Y is S plus SI plus N and N is as we just discussed a random vector with 0 mean and identity covariance of course, identity multiplied by sigma square. Now, there are two ways to find the optimal symbol sent and both are, have uh, both are very related. The first is the maximum likelihood decision rule. In the maximum likelihood decision case, what we are saying is why do not we maximize the probability that uh, we want to find that i such that this y was the most likely one. The second one is the minimum probability of error in which case you also take into account the prior that is suppose that the probability of sending 0 is higher and the probability of sending 1 is lower. The m minimum probability of error actually performs a modification for the priors. I will just try to give you an intuition as to why these rules come about. So, if you remember, let me just, yeah, if you remember the joint distribution, of, I mean your, your n is actually Gaussian with 0 and sigma square i as the variance, which means your, uh, your r vector or you know in this particular case we use the notation r, your r vector is actually S i plus n because that is what we got which means your n is essentially r minus S i. Okay. So, let us just check what symbols we are using there. Yeah, we are using y. Okay. Let us say y. Your y vector is this. So, y minus S i. Okay. Y minus S i. So, let us write the joint distribution of n. So, f n of n is 1 by root of 2 pi power n, okay. 1 by 2 pi power let us say in this case n that is fine times sigma, I think yeah, it should just sigma into 2 pi power n, I am going to ignore this part because it is a constant. Okay, this is a constant anyway, e power minus, now instead of n, I am going to write y minus s i, Hermitian or transpose depending on real or complex, for now let me write transpose, c x inverse that is i upon sigma square, I am just writing the 2 times y minus s i. Okay. So, this is essentially what you have. And this is the likelihood function also because I have substituted for n in terms of these and I want to maximize this. So, you want to maximize this. This particular thing is a constant that does not depend on i. I want to now find which i was sent. So, what I am going to do is I am just going to maximize i is equal to 0, 1, 2 and so on up to say m minus 1. Okay e power minus and because there is just identity, it is y minus s i, y minus s i, it is essentially y minus s i transpose y minus s i that can be written as y minus s i square by 2 sigma square. But here, this does not depend on i. So, all I need to do is I can take log and if I take log, then I get maximize over i minus norm y minus s i square which is the same as saying minimize with i norm y minus s i square. This translates to minimum distance decoding. Why? Because you are saying let us just assume that my s i's are vectors in some space and my y is a vector find me that s i that is closest to this y in terms of squared distance. This means 
the maximum likelihood decoder is just the minimum distance decoder. This is for ML. Similarly, for MPE, it is not very difficult. For MPE, all you need to do is you need to take into account the prior probability of what was sent. So, without going into too much details, I am just going to write it as some constant times e power minus again it will be norm y minus si square by 2 sigma square times pi i where pi i is the prior probability. That means if you have a higher probability of sending 0, let us say that your messages, messages are 0 and 1. Let us say that the probability of sending 0 is 0 0.8 and the probability of sending 1 is 0 0.2 that is captured in pi i. So, I want to now maximize this over i which is same as maximizing I am just going to take log over here some monotonic function ignoring the constants minus norm y minus s i square by 2 sigma square plus log pi i this is log with respect to log to the base e this is same as minimizing over i norm y minus s i square and I am multiplying by 2 sigma square minus 2 sigma square log of pi of i. So, this is the MPE rule, okay? the minimum probability of error rule. If this comes about because see let's give, let us give me give you an intuition. If you have a very very um, high like high probability of 1 being on 1 or no, 0 being sent let us say. So, even if you get something which is closer to 1, it could be because 1 was actually sent but the noise event was higher. So, the a minimum probability of error essentially takes that into account. So, I am skipping over the complete derivation, but the key intuition is that if you write the likelihood function and you want to maximize it, the maximizing of the likelihood function essentially results in this particular result. And if you go back to our slides, it is very evident this delta ml involves finding the argmin means just find me that i. So, it finds that i that minimizes norm y minus s i square. This is same as minimum distance decoding. Another way to interpret this is you can actually expand this, this becomes y y transpose y transpose y plus norm s i square minus 2 times inner product of y comma s i. So, if you now look at norm you know y y trans y transpose y that does not have i in it, you take that away and try, uh, subtract. So, maybe I will just do this once for you, oops sorry, yeah. If you look at norm y minus s i square that is equal to y minus s i transpose y minus s i replace Hermitian for complex is equal to y transpose y plus s i transpose s i minus 2 inner product y s i. This can be done either using the vectors or using the function integration also. If you want to know max, if you know want to minimize over this, you know you want to minimize over this right that is same as maximizing and you take this away and put a negative sign and you divide by 2 you get y comma s i minus s i norm s i square upon 2. This is exactly what is being written over here you know and over here there are some advantages if you have constant envelope signal meaning if your all the norm s i's are the same you can just find inner product y s i and find out which one was sent and you can just do a similar modification over here to get what was the best you know minimum probability of error decision. The only difference is the minimum probability of error takes into account the priors. If all pi i's are equal that is for example, if you have m symbols and each of them has a probability of 1 upon m then this rule reduces to this because there is no dependence on i. So, the m p e and m l are the same when all the original symbols are equally probable, which is the case in the most general situations. If you want to think of some situation where you know uh, you do not have equal priors, typically you know because 
these uh, coding is performed to have the same press for all the uh, signals. So like if you have, so for example, some data where there are many, many zeros and few ones, many, many zeros and few ones, typically they compress the data to have equal number of zeros and ones while they capture the original data. But let us suppose that you have a situation where, you know, it's one only when it rains, but zero when it doesn't, something like that then it may be more likely to have, you know, days when it doesn't rain, you know, so you have more zeros and ones and things like that. Or you're capturing a signal from a sensor and it detects some, you know, whenever there's an earthquake, earthquakes are rare, so you have more zeros. So things like that may happen, but typically it is, uh, the data is encoded in a way so that you have equal, pro prob equal probable symbols. So this will be more common, but this does have its uses whenever it, arises. <clears throat> so if you want a formal proof of this is just exactly what we did right, right now. Why is a Gaussian random variable and its mean is SI and covariance matrix is sigma square i. So if you write the distribution of y, you p y given i is uh, you know under the hypothesis i is 1 by 2 pi sigma square per n by 2 e power minus norm y minus SI square. I just expanded that norm my y minus si square by applying that cx inverse formula for you. The ML rule wants you to maximize the quantity with respect to i and you know since log is monotonic you can maximize with respect to the log of this function as well. So you can clearly see that only y minus si matters. In the case where you have MPE just add the pi i over here that accounts for the prior and your set. That is basically the proof that the minimum distance decoder is optimal in the case of additive white Gaussian noise. This is an important result and allows you to get a fair idea of what the so called decision regions are. So to find out which y, which SI was sent if you have y. Let us look at a very quick example. If we consider on off signaling, your y of t is essentially s of t plus n of t and uh, if you were sent nothing, your y of t is n of t. So hypothesis 1 is that some signal was sent, hypothesis 0 is that nothing was sent. So in this particular case of binary signaling, we are considering on off signaling. So there is either something sent or nothing sent. Let us compute a statistic z which is inner product y comma s. Okay. It makes sense because see here what you expect is a signal of uh, about norm y, uh, s square while in the second case you expect a signal which is around 0, right? Because in the first case, let us say you send a square wave, you want a signal with amplitude around that square wave. In the second case, you want a signal whose amplitude is around 0. That is what you expect. So the de decision rule is to find the energy of the resulting signal and see whether the resulting signal's energy is above or below norm s square by 2. That is the intuition, right? We do not know if this is correct but we can use the ML uh, to verify it. And if you look at the ML and if you perform the ML in this case, it is very easy because you have only a vector y and you have to decide whether it is <coughs> your, your basically your SIs are 0 or you know S of t. So if you now write the ML probabilities, you will easily find that probability of making an error <coughs> given that one was sent was that you sent one but for some reason you decided that 0 was sent and similarly you sent 0 but you decided for some reason that 1 was sent. So for example, if you have the situation where you send this because of noise it essentially comes like this, then you make a mistake or if you send 0 because of noise it becomes something like this, then you make a mistake. So these are actually in hypothesis testing, these are the so called I think type, uh, you know, there, there are these type 1, type 2 errors, it is very similar what is the probability that you are, you make a mistake? That is, what is the probability that you actually sent S of t but you decided that 0 was sent or what is the probability that you sent 0 and decided that S of t was sent? So these are some things that we are, we will have to see for various modulation schemes as well and we will continue this in the forthcoming lectures. Thank you.